Hello everyone, we are coming in for the next video, for our first video for the month of August, and as, I think it's, yeah, it's been two weeks since we did our last one, because I went camping, but now we're back. So, for the first video for this month, what I want, I wanted to take a delve back a little bit into ancient history a little bit, because of some similarities with a certain issue that is really coming to the forefront. And it, some of the parallels to what is happening in the United States right now is quite alarming when you look at certain things in ancient history or history in general. And one of the ones that we're going to go ahead and kind of go over today is something that I'm not really going to go so much into the connection. I'm going to let you kind of discern that for yourself. But I will point out when there's something that is kind of worrisome. But what we're going to cover today is the fall of the Roman Republic. And everyone knows the Roman Empire. Everyone knows Rome. Uh, if there's one thing from ancient history that everybody knows, they know Rome, they know the Greeks. And everyone knows everyone knows the Romans, Romans for their empire that spanned one of the largest ones in history. But a lot of people forget that Rome was not always an empire. Rome had been a republic. Rome had actually been a kingdom to start out with that had then overthrown its Etruscan king and then become a republic, and then eventually that collapsed. And that is what we're going to look at today, is how did this republic collapse, this democracy that the Romans had set up? How does this Roman democracy come apart and devolve to the point that we allow one man with almost absolute power to take control, that being the emperor, who is going to now be the Roman emperor for the next four centuries of Roman history. And for those of you who might already be a little bit familiar with this story, and this is something that most of us learn at school at some point, so for some of this is probably simply a, a refresher. But for those of you who may be already aware of how the Roman Republic kind of fell apart, you know that there is one man who is probably the single biggest... I should say, not the guy that actually, he is not the guy that actually accomplishes it, but he is the guy that instigates all of this. He's the number one instigator for why the Republic really ended up collapsing, and that was none other than probably the most famous Roman in Roman history, Mr. Julius Caesar. Yes, your Caesar salads. Not really. <laughs> but Julius Caesar, for... I just I don't even really think he needs any introduction here. I, we all know who Julius Caesar was, the prominent general, the the statesman, political dictator, whatever you want to call him. He, he's almost renowned, even if you don't know history that well. Everyone knows who Julius Caesar was. And Julius Caesar is going to be instrumental in really setting up the stage for the ultimate downfall of the Roman Republic. And this is going to happen, it happens over years. The Republic, since the Second Punic War, had already had quite a few problems really start to come in. Corruption was taking rampant, corruption was rampant in the Roman Republic among the senators, in particular the arist aristocratic elite. You also had certain people and generals that came to power that kind of tried to make themselves absolute rulers. Most notably, you had, for example, Sulla in the about 80s B.C., and Sulla does not ultimately get as long as Caesar, but he does get named dictator for pretty much as long as he wants. And he kind of forces that. But Caesar comes into his own through his political means, and it kind of goes on from there. So when the first time that Caesar really becomes a major political figure, I think, in the Roman Republic. Mind you, he'd already been a Roman general. He had already been involved in the military affairs of the Republic. He was not a stranger to many, but he was not seen as a major politician quite yet until the year 59 BC. And in 59 BC, through political maneuvering and through the power and prestige that he holds within the military, Caesar is able to get himself to become one of Rome's three consuls that is now going to form this first, what we call the first triumvirate of, of leadership for the Roman Republic. The first triumvirate was an alliance between Julius Caesar and two of his rivals. One was Crassus, who was the richest man in Rome. He, and he was also a little bit up there in age as well, but he's pretty much there because of his wealthy position. And then you have another military general who's also part of that triumvirate, who's also one of Caesar's rivals, and that is Pompey. And Pompey and Caesar don't get along that well. Crassus is just kind of there. 
as part of the old elite guard, pretty much. The old aristocratic elite got to have their say. And what comes about in 59 BC is this alliance between the three that we will govern the Roman Republic together. We'll work together on this. We'll split the Republic between the three of us into governing regions and zones, and we'll go from there. The Roman Senate, however, when the first triumvirate was formed in 59 BC, actually feared the, the forming of this triumvirate because they correctly guessed that it, the three consuls would control Rome, that they would pretty much have more power than the Roman senators would in the Roman Senate, and this was not something they really liked. In fact, that had been a major problem of corruption over the decades was whenever somebody tried to take power away from the aristocratic elite in the Senate, they often tried to stall or actively would work against those individuals, even sometimes assassinating them, because they did not want to lose their political power and their wealth and influence. Well, this time they're going to lose that, but they're not losing it to the common people. They're losing it to people that are just like them, but smarter in many ways. Now, Pompey would remain a bitter rival to Caesar, though, even in during the first triumvirate. Even though they were co-rulers, even though they were co-consuls, they were not friends. They still had this bit of rivalry with each other, which is really going to shape the events that would follow. Over the next few years in the first triumvirate, Caesar would expand Roman territory. He would go on these grand military campaigns and conquer new territory and lands for the Roman Republic that had previously been seen as unconquerable and had not been able to be taken control of. Most notably, most of these territories that Caesar would gain were in the region of Gaul in the Gallic Wars. And Gaul is what is now France, pretty much. That is what Gaul is. But to the Romans, they called it Gaul. And Caesar would go on these massive, grand military campaigns in Gaul, win these massive military and grand military victories against the native Gallic tribes there and the, you know, the Celts, and would manage to conquer most of Gaul for the Roman Republic, and then even went on to take certain small areas of Germania, which was largely untouched by the Roman Empire, and it held its own native tribes. And then they even Caesar even crossed the English Channel and went into Britain, went into Britannia, as the Romans would call it. So Caesar, during his years as a member of the First Triumvirate, is really shoring up his popularity at home by going on these massive military grand, grandiose campaigns that are bringing glory and wealth and riches to Rome. Rome and the Roman Republic is getting larger. People love him for this. And he grows his popularity through these military campaigns. He also is very good with his troops. He takes good care of them. He cares about them. He thinks about their needs. And he gains the loyalty of his troops in the process. That is going to set up a major problem for anybody that wants to oppose Caesar because he's gaining popularity both amongst the military and at home, and that's going to be pretty hard to counter if he tries to make any kind of a power move. Pompey, his rival on the triumvirate, recognizes this, and he is jealous of Caesar's military successes and his conquests, and he begins to actively oppose him at home by starting to ally in the Roman Senate with senators who are opposed to Caesar's rise in power. And the, ch the changing point would come in 50 54 BC. Crassus ended up dying that year, trying to go on his own campaign against the Parthian Empire, which failed, and the Parthians ended up killing Crassus. So Crassus's attempt to gain himself military glory, like Caesar and Pompey, who were military generals, failed utterly, and ends up costing him his life. So now, one of the members of the Triumvirate is dead. Pompey makes his power move at this moment in 54 BC, and allying with Caesar's opponents in the Senate, he sends an order to Caesar along with the Senate. They send this order to Caesar that you are to relinquish command of your army in Gaul, in Gaul and you are to return to Italy as a private citizen and come before the Senate. Basically, we're going to arrest you. We don't have any charges. You're not supposed to come and head an army. You're going to pretty much come back home. And Caesar sees this for what sees for what it is. He knows that it's Pompey's political maneuvering that they probably intend to make sure that he's no longer a threat to Pompey, who can then pursue his own political goals. And Caesar is 
power hungry at this point. He doesn't much care how he gets things done. So instead of complying with the Senate's order to come back to Italy and relinquish control of his army, he instead refuses marching with his army into Italy across the Rubicon River and then proceeding to march on Rome, which then causes the Roman senators and Pompey to flee that had opposed him. And this initiates a civil war against Pompey between between Pompey and his supporters and then Julius Caesar and his. Now, Julius Caesar would and his supporters were largely successful almost from the get-go. They would end up driving Pompey from Italy and then pursued him into Greece, and then Pompey would flee into, into, the, into the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt. And this is where the story gets a little interesting. It's also where Egypt kind of gets involved. Egypt at this time is still its own independent kingdom, but it is very close to becoming a vassal state if it is not already of the Roman Roman Republic. It's already clear that at some point there is going to be conflict between the Ptolemaic kingdom in Egypt and Rome as the Roman Republic seeks to expand and Egypt is basically seeking to still retain its own sovereignty and independence at this point in time. And hearing the Egyptian pharaoh, who was like 15 years old at this time, he's a boy king. So we have Ptolemy VIII, and he is the Egyptian pharaoh of the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt. And he hears Pompey's in Egypt. He also knows that there's a civil war going on in the Roman Republic, and he knows that there's a good chance that if he continues to allow Pompey to stay in Egypt, that the Roman Republic could declare war on Egypt and say that they're harboring you know, our enemy, since Caesar pretty much have, has all the power now back at home. So Ptolemy kind of takes the preemptive move. He actually has Pompey captured in his kingdom and then executed in September of 48 BC. And then when Caesar gets to Egypt in pursuit of Pompey, Ptolemy decides, I'm going to have an audience with Caesar. So he brings him to an audience, invites him to an audience in the palace. And then as a gift to try to keep the Romans from invading Egypt as a peace offering almost to Caesar, he presents Pompey's head in a box. This says, oh, yeah, you were enemies with Pompey, aren't you? That's who you're after? Oh, here's his head. Here, we killed him for you. Please don't invade us. <laughs> Consider it a gift. And Caesar, according to his ancient accounts, strangely enough, Caesar was not exactly grateful that the Egyptians had killed Pompey because although he was rivals with the man, he still respected him. And at one time, they had been allies in the military. And to Caesar, he, according to the ancient accounts, and I suppose we'll never know for sure, there's always been this consistent uh, characterization that Caesar was not the most pleased that, you know, Ptolemy was presenting him with Pompey's head as if it was no big deal. And Caesar, having had a history with the man, kind of kind of pointed out that, you know, I at least respected him. I wasn't going to do that to him. But instead... What happens, Caesar's now in Egypt, Pompey's dead, but he also, while he's there, becomes involved in another conflict that is going on locally in the area, as Ptolemy is a boy king, and he has technically usurped the throne from his older sister, Cleopatra. Yes, the Egyptian queen. And Cleopatra at this time is running a civil war against her brother for control of the Ptolemaic kingdom. She wants to be pharaoh, and she wants her brother off the throne, who she had viewed as unjustly deposing her. Caesar becomes romantically involved with Cleopatra, and he ends up siding with her in this Egyptian civil war that is transpiring against Ptolemy, and it helps her gain back her throne. They end up, during this romantic affair, they never married, but they did end up having a child named Caesaron, which would eventually become a problem for his adopted son Octavian, or Augustus, because here is a legitimate son to Caesar, who could technically claim, you know, some level of inheritance from him. <coughs> but Caesar would spend the next two years helping Cleopatra win her, the civil war in Egypt against her brother, and then once she, her brother had been killed, he also stayed there helping her to wipe out any of the remaining supporters of either Ptolemy or Pompey that had remained in Egypt. In 46 BC, Caesar returns home. And upon returning home, he is declared dictator for 10 years by the Roman Senate. 
and this allows him to make drastic reforms that benefited the lower and middle classes in Rome. But when he's declared dictator, it isn't so much the Roman Senate just conferring the title on him. It's more Caesar has all the power and influence that he needs amongst the people, and he kind of forces the Senate to give him this title. The Senate does not just give it willingly, because the title of dictator, it is a Roman title they used to give to give somebody almost absolute power during times of crisis in the Republic. And eventually they were supposed to give it up. So at initially, Caesar only gets 10 years. They're saying for 10 years, you'll be dictator. You are free to try to stabilize this Republic. Although many of the senators are quite angered by this, particularly the ones that are politically opposed to him, because they view it as, you know, he is wanting to become an autocrat. And you're handing him power for 10 years. He's already displayed that by going to war and eliminating his two pol his political opponent in Pompey. And now he's displaying that in his conquest. So he wants to be the ruler of an empire almost pretty much. And you guys are enticing this autocrat to hold that power. And that becomes a major contention point amongst the senators is because the last time they granted anybody the title of dictator, you had Sulla, who had been quite the dictator and did go on political purges of his political opponents and murdered anybody that opposed him. So there is quite the hesitance to give this title out again. On 46 BC, Caesar is officially dictator for 10 years. Among his reforms that he would introduce were the following. Caesar would introduce a new regulation of grain distribution to help feed the poor. He would increase the size of the Senate to allow for greater representation in the Republic. He would reduce government debt, which really isn't all that bad of a thing for anybody. He would also support military veterans, given that he himself was a former military general and still was. He would also grant Roman citizenship to almost everyone within the Roman Republic, even those that did not live directly within Italy. And he would also work on reforming the tax codes, which would allow the poor to start paying less. The lower, the lower and middle classes would pay less in taxes, while the upper classes would pay more. And among probably his most uh, astounding achievement was the creation of the Julian calendar. Rome had been using a lunar calendar for some time. It had become quite out of sync. And Caesar gets rid of this, throws it out completely, and he introduces a calendar named after himself and even names one of the months, July, after himself. That's where the month of July comes from. It comes from Julius Caesar. But the lower and middle classes, because of these reforms that Caesar introduces, they absolutely adore the man. They love the man. He's done all these good things that most of these reforms benefit them. So, of course, it grows his popularity base even further to the point that Caesar pretty much feels, I can do anything I want. The Senate can oppose me all they want, but they can't do a thing because the people are with me. They have no stake in this matter whatsoever. And that would bring us to that tragic day that I think we all know of what happened to Julius Caesar. We all know Caesar ended up being killed, and that is going to set the ball in motion for the events that would follow. In 44 BC, Caesar would illegally this time, the Senate did not grant him this title, he proclaimed it himself. But in 44 BC, he illegally declared himself dictator for life that he would be the dictator for as long as he lived. And this enraged the Roman Senate, who up to this point have been slowly growing in their in their defiance to him and in their very much anger toward him. Now he dares to blatantly go in front of the Roman constitution and blatantly say, I am now dictator for life. I don't need the Senate's permission to do this. The people give me this permission. I don't need you. I can go against you. I can do whatever I want. This enrages the Roman Senate, who now sees him as a direct threat to the continuation of the Roman Republic, and they see him as pretty much he wants to be king. He wants to be a king, and Rome has not had a king at this time in 500 years. We don't want to go back to that. So on March 15th of 44 BC, over a dozen senators of the Roman Senate, Senate ended up assassinating Caesar as he was preparing to speak to them by stabbing him over 23 times. They believe that they were defending and saving liberty and democracy in doing this act, but by do assassinating Caesar and stabbing him, and by killing him, they ended up doing just the opposite. They only expedited the fall of the Republic even quicker. Now, the assassins believed 
that they were basically these defenders of democracy. And one of them, Marcus Junius Brutus, had even been a close confidant of Caesar's and had kind of realized what Caesar was becoming and turned against him. So what happens next is civil war. The, fall, the death of Caesar was not at all what the assassins had planned in 44 BC when they had planned that upon Caesar's death, you know, once they announced it to the public that Caesar had been killed and that the tyrant is dead and the republic is restored, that they would be praised, that the people would be so happy. And this is not what happens. The people are utterly angry that Caesar has been, that has, has been assassinated because most of his reforms had benefited them. And they see this once again as a move by the old aristocracy to kind of, you know, just maintain power for themselves and maintain their influence and afraid of it going away. And the people are enraged over Caesar's death. They're not happy about it at all, which is quite the unexpected outcome. And the Roman Republic, and as a consequence, would plunge into civil war with Caesar's supporters seeking to first go after any of the assassins who had escaped, and then, once they couldn't find any, started turning on themselves. And out of this chaos, there comes two figures that are going to come into play here during after Caesar's death. And the first one is Caesar's former deputy, Mark Antony. And Mark Antony positions himself after Caesar's assassination as Caesar's heir apparent. He is Caesar's successor. He is the rightful successor to Caesar. And he kind of paints himself in this, you know, glorious picture and this figurotic way at the funeral oration that he gives at Caesar's funeral. And that is where Mark Antony starts coming into play. He kind of, He's young. He's he served under Caesar in the military. He says, that, you know, I'm the perfect person to kind of lead Rome. And this is Mark Antony, or a painting of it. This is a painting of him of that oration at Caesar's funeral. We have Caesar's dead body on display. The crowd is angry. They're holding up knives. They're wanting to go after the people that have done this. And Mark is up here just trying to kind of, you know, put forward his views on the man and also paint himself as the successor. The problem for Antony comes that Caesar had somewhat in had somewhat kind of already thought about what happens if I die. Who would be my successor? And Caesar, in his will, had actually actually already indicated a successor that he wanted to succeed him. In his will, he indicated that his young and sickly 18-year-old great-nephew, great Octavian, who he had pretty much adopted as his adopted son, was to be his heir, who is very young, is only 18 years old. And Octavian... And in response to being named in Caesar's will and thus getting a lot of the inheritance that comes from his great uncle's death, he amasses a large private army and gains support from several Roman legions because of the fact that Caesar had put him in his will. This would end up leading to Octavian clashing with Antony for control of the Republic, with Antony claiming that he is the rightful successor just due to merit and due to his service under Caesar, and Octavian claiming it under, I'm in Caesar's will and I'm his great nephew, I'm family, I should be the successor to my great uncle. <coughs> So eventually they're going to come to the blows with each other. And this here, this is Octavian when he, at, the, at about the time when he was about, in his, about 20 years old. So this is him, what will soon become the first Roman emperor, Augustus. So what is going to happen now is Octavian and Antony, after clashing for a small bit, they come to terms and realize... Okay, we got other problems to deal with. There's still the assassins running around that had killed Julius Caesar. We need to go after them. We need to stabilize this republic a little bit right now because it's chaos. And they come to terms that for temporarily we'll call a truce. And they do call a truce with each other and agree to share power, like much like Caesar had done almost 20 or 30 years earlier, along with another uh, one of Caesar's former deputies named Lepidus, who form what they call the Second Triumvirate in 43 BC, which is going to split the Roman Republic into three administrative zones. Lepidus would mostly govern over lands in Africa. Antony would get those in, e in the east, such as those in Turkey and Greece. And then Octavian would get the west, such as Caesar's former provinces in Gaul that he had been governor of, also those in 
the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain is, and then all three of them would have authority in Italy, in, in the capital city, of course. And this second triumvirate would mainly go after perceived enemies of the Republic during its rule. It was not as stable as the first, because although there was a truce going on between Anthony and Octavian, there's Still very suspicious of each other, and it's a very begrudging truce. They are both still arguing over who is the rightful successor to Caesar's legacy. And the triumvirate would end up purging the leadership of the Republic and killing enemies and any potential rivals that they came across who they viewed as a threat to the Republic's continuation or their own goals. For example, after speaking ill of Mark Antony, the noted Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero was ended up being killed by soldiers that were loyal to Mark Anthony simply for him speaking out against him and speaking illly of him. They then had Cicero's head and right hand put on display in the Roman Forum for all the public to see as kind of a message to those that, you know, you speak against Antony, this is what will come to you. Don't matter how powerful it all, you are, don't matter how famous you are, it don't matter what prestige or power you hold, you will be held accountable for your actions against them. Even though Caesar really hadn't done all that much. And Octavian and Antony would end up cooperating in going after the forces of, assassin, of the assassins Brutus and Gaius Cassius in 42 BC. Two of the men that we, Brutus, have we, as we mentioned earlier, but Cassius was another. Both of these men had been involved in the assassination of Caesar. They had both participated in it. Now they were amassing their own private supportive army who is now, they're now arguing, you know, we got to put down this triumvirate of Caesar's grand nephew and his two of his former military deputies because now they're seizing control of the republic and they end up going to battle against octavian and antony at the battle of philippi in northern greece in 42 bc they end up losing this tens of thousands dead and eventually what happens is after the battle cassius and brutus ended up committing suicide they ended up killing themselves to avoid capture and avoid any further uh, chance that, you know, they would live long enough to see the Republic fall, which it already was. And I think that might have been maybe one reason why they also did. They realized that, you know, they are losing and the Republic at this point was collapsing right in front of their eyes. And I think that given their professed love for it, maybe they didn't want to live long enough to see that actually happen. That That's one way of thinking about it. But Antony, not Antony, but Octavian and Antony would remain rivals after the death of Cassius and Brutus, and after the Battle of Philippi, the year, a year later, in 41 BC, they would actually end up renewing their rivalry with each other and going back to pretty much to war with each other. Antony would begin, during this time, a romantic and political alliance with Cleopatra, uh, the queen of Egypt that Caesar had been involved with. And he ends up kind of becoming her lover and her ally in Roman politics. And they are trying to oppose Octavian's power moves. And it's probably not a big secret to Octavian why this, this would be a case. Because number one, Cleopatra is the mother of Caesaron. Caesaron is a biological child of Julius Caesar. He has a claim to, Jul to Julius Caesar's inheritance and a claim to be his successor, and this would run against Octavian's claim. Octavian's not dumb to that. He knows that that might be a reason why Antony is moving against him with Cleopatra. He also is aware that, you know, Antony is having an affair at this point because you're married legally to my younger sister. You're married to Octavia and he's having an affair with this Egyptian queen. And the fact that Cleopatra is seeking to kind of maintain her own kingdom's sovereignty is also probably a reason why she's even willing to ally with Antony because she very much probably sees Octavian as, you know, you're going to annex this Egypt into the Roman Republic because of the factor that I'm a threat to your claim to power with my son and Antony is more than willing to kind of placate that and kind of treat me as an equal on the table. And Lepidus would end up being forced out of this, out of this whole debacle in 37 BC because he ended up being fear, forced into exile by, by Octavian in that year. He was not really a very strong power player in the Second Triumvirate, and Octavian was pretty much able to get him to jump ship and say, nope, you're not coming back, leave and never come back. In 32 BC, Antony would divorce Octavia, Octavian's sister, over his affair with Cleopatra, which then gave Octavian the excuse to declare war on Egypt and Cleopatra in response.
Eventually, this short-lived war between the Roman Republic and Egypt, which eventually did come about, would end in 31 BC at the naval battle of Actium, in which Octavian's fleet would corner and defeat Antony's fleet. Cleopatra's Egyptian navy did try to come to the assistance of Antony's fleet during the battle, but they were not really able to get there in a favorable time, and when they did arrive, Antony and Cleopatra both were lucky to escape. They both made it out, but barely. Most of their ships had been captured or sunk, along with most of their crews killed. But following the defeat at Actium, both Cleopatra and Antony would actually end up committing suicide in Egypt once they got back to Egypt, and that left just Caesaron, and then Octavian would now be Rome's undisputed ruler, because Lapidus is in exile, Antony is finally dead, he's no longer a threat to me, I can go ahead and I can claim sole leadership of the empire. And just to ensure that, in 30 BC, he would even have Caesaron, who at that time was 17 years old, murdered and executed just to ensure that there was absolutely nobody that could try to even try to challenge his claim to power. That even this biological child of my great on my great uncle cannot claim that, you know, what, what is technically my uncle <laughs> is what it would be. So it technically would have been Octavian's uncle. He even went as far as to make sure that that was taken care of, that that wasn't going to be any kind of a threat to his hold on power. So now that he is the sole ruler of the Roman Republic, Octavian pretty much has all the power and influence that he wants, except he has even more than his uncle than his great uncle did. He has more popularity than Julius Caesar ever did, and this is going to allow him to use that mass popularity to establish absolute rule for himself. He would approve all candidates running for election with the Senate acting basically as a rubber stamp for his decision. So basically, unless a candidate had the endorsement and had the approval of Augustus or Octavian at this point, it's still Octavian, but unless you had the endorsement and approval of Octavian, you can't run. You can't run in the election because you're not approved by him. You would also have citizens throughout Roman territory would be required to swear personal loyalty to Octavian, and coins and statues and all manner of artwork would start to also bear his image in order to build the kind of this cult of personality around the man. And this is just going to gain his more loyal following. It's going to ensure that the people in politics are loyal to him and that the general population continues to be loyal to him to the point that he can continue to keep the Senate kind of as this rubber stamp. The Senate can't really do much. It's just kind of there. You're, you're there in name only. You're not a governing institution. And in 27 BC, the final straw came that ended the Roman Republic for good. And that was when, under pressure from the public, the Senate was forced to bestow the title of Augustus to Octavian, which he would take as his new name as Augustus Caesar, which is where the month of August comes from. The month of August was named by Octavian for Augustus, and so was October. October was named for him as well. But under this new name of Augustus, under the new name of Augustus Caesar, Octavian would rule as Augusta, Emperor Augustus Caesar for the rest of his life. He would rule for over half a century more, and he would be one of the longest-lived emperors, if not the longest-lived, of the Roman emperors. He would become Pretty much at this point, he is now Roman emperor. He is the first emperor of no longer the Roman Republic, but a Roman Empire under his absolute rule. And... What was strange is during his reign, Augustus never actually referred to himself as emperor. His successors would, but and as part of this ploy to still appear as the people's candidate, as the people's man, the, the man of the people, not this autocrat, he, didn't, he refused to use the title of emperor. Instead, he would use the title and call himself Rome's first citizen that had restored the Republic, that I didn't destroy it, I restored it. I, I am the first citizen of the Republic. I am not an emperor. When in reality, that's exactly what he was. He just was being very modest and didn't want to use the title because of the bad connotations that could come with that title. And his ascension to control over the Roman Republic and the start of the Roman Empire would lead to the two centuries of peace that followed, which are known as the Pax Romana, 
where Rome, the Roman Empire would grow spectacularly. It would enjoy immense prosperity, both in architecture and improving its facilities, improving its infrastructure, improving its economy, expanding its territory and money, trade, everything. And there was very little conflict, very little wars during this next two centuries after Augustus formally takes power as Roman emperor in 27 BC. But that pretty much is a wrap up of what happens here. It's a straight, it's a straight line. Julius Caesar sets the stage for the fall of the Republic, but it is his great nephew that carries it out and actually demolishes the democracy that had stood for 500 years and turns it into absolute rule, mostly through the use of using mass popularity like his great uncle to really get what he wants and go against the established institutions and basically say, your opinion doesn't matter because I have the backing of the people. And whatever I want to do, I'm endorsed to because the people chose me. That I can do whatever I want. Don't matter if it's you, if it's not what the people truly want. But because the people chose me earlier on, I can do what I want. And that pretty much is what comes from that. And Rome would be governed as a Roman Empire for the next four centuries after Augustus' death. But that pretty much wraps up. That and right here, this at the time, this was the Roman Republic in about 30 BC. Well, maybe not 30 BC, this was about 40 BC. So, the only area that would really be added to this upon the Roman Empire's ascension would be mostly Egypt here would be fully under Roman control. You would also have all of Hispania and even part of Britain up here. But this would be about the state of Rome at that time, just for reference. But that completes for this video not the longest video just something i felt i wanted to kind of go over and talk about since it's kind of relevant to what's going on right now in some ways but something that i felt would also allow us to delve a little bit into ancient history so if anyone has any comments any questions or any added information that you want to add put it in the comment section below and i'll be more than happy to go through them if needed and as for we should have definitely have a video next week i don't know what it's going to be yet but we will have one. I just don't know what the topic is yet. So any suggestions, put them in. So that will conclude for this week's video. And hopefully everyone continues to stay well. And we will see you all back here next week for our next video for the month, which will be sometime next week. So until then, everyone stay well.